Hello and welcome to the first in the series of YouTube videos that I want to produce about PIC microcontrollers. And before we say what a PIC microcontroller is, we've got to ask what a microcontroller is and how that differs from the sorts of components we'll find on a standard computer. So this is a motherboard or a picture of a motherboard, fairly typical motherboard that you'd find in a, in a desktop PC. And in general, you'll have a CPU, which is like the brains of the computer. You have some slots for memory or RAM. And then you have some expansion slots, which control uh, lots of the input output devices, as well as in this case. And as is the case in many modern motherboards, you also have some equipment built in. So you'll have some USB ports, probably a network socket, maybe some audio and video connectors. They're all, all built in and controlled by various components on the board here. We also have these two blocks, which are the what they call the North Bridge and South Bridge. And they are the interface between the CPU and in this case, the memory bus, which is fast. And in this case, the kind of IO bus for these kind of things, which is a bit slower. But as you might imagine, this is quite an expensive thing to buy. And it's also quite big. So if you are into hobby electronics and you want to get into the idea of programming computers to control devices, control things like relays and temperature sensors and what have you. This is a very expensive way of doing it. And most of these motherboards are not designed for input output expansion. So if you want to connect any devices onto this, then you'll probably already need to buy some kind of expansion card or something that goes from USB to whatever interface that you need. So that's not really an option um, for most of us because of the price and the space it's going to take up. Programming it is quite complicated because probably you're going to end up with something like Windows or you know Linux running on it. You're going to have to write a program and you're going to have to load a load of libraries to do all the stuff for you. It's quite kind of uh, a lot of work to do something very simple. So what about the Raspberry Pi? Well, the Raspberry Pi is really just a, a small version of what we've just looked at. So it's still a single board computer. You still have the CPU, which I think is that device there. You have the, uh, oh, which one is this? Oh, the Model B. So you have the uh, memory card slot here. You have the HDMI output for the screen. Um, you've got various connectors that are built in already. And the only difference really with this, it's quite a lot cheaper. It's quite a lot smaller than a desktop PC, but you're still talking about a significant amount of money for what might be something very simple. One of the advantages of the Raspberry Pi, however, is it is designed to interface. And these pins across the top here are what they call general purpose input output. And this is the connector or connectors that allow you to connect the Raspberry Pi to the rest of your electronics. So what you'll often have uh, with something like a Raspberry Pi is you could have something like GPIO, let's say to I don't know, maybe an SPI interface. And then it will tell you here, these are the pins that you use on those headers to, net, to connect to SPI. And then you'll probably find somewhere they'll sell a little adapter that you can buy or you kind of rig it up like this with the connectors. Plug it into your breadboard uh, and you can kind of do what you need to do. Add your push button or whatever that is. So it kind of works. It's still quite a big device. And one of the problems is it's still quite a high level system. So you're still running an operating system, which means you need to write a program that's going to run on that operating system. That program's probably going to have a user interface. Um, you've got a number of things that you need to do to make that do a very simple job. So it's kind of much better than your standard PC, but it's still, for most hobby electronics people, it's still going to be too expensive and too complicated to do something like controlling motors and relays and things like that. And that brings us back to the idea of a microcontroller. So we have a microcontroller. It's a chip. So it's just like looks like that. So it looks like one of these and they do them in different sizes, as you might imagine. I mean, microchip who make the pick series of microcontrollers. So they're a company 
and they have hundreds and hundreds of different models of a microcontroller the 8-bit ones are the most basic series they're the cheapest they have the least amount of memory and the least number of input output pins and stuff like that but because they're cheap then it's very easy for people like me and you to go and buy them from somewhere um, and to experiment if they go bang then it only costs 10 pence or something so it's a very cheap way of putting really a, a whole computer on a single chip you only need a handful of small components you basically need a, a clock um, crystal uh, and that's pretty much it and a power supply and then this will run by itself without needing any other components so what you have a very simple very easy way of controlling uh, input output so how does this work well it works in a similar way to writing a program for the desktop so you need to write some code you then need to put that code onto the chip so that the code runs on the chip and then the program hopefully will take care of itself and the tool chain is what we call it how do we go from design and code to the device is we start in something like this so this is microchip picks lab so it's a, it's a development environment and you can download it for free from microchip and you should um, because this is where we're going to be writing our example programs so you write some code in here you can then debug it in this environment so even without needing any hardware any chips or any programming boards or anything like that you can run it in the debugger it's very basic but it will allow you to kind of check that bits are kind of turning off and on and that kind of stuff so you start here when you're then ready to actually program it from within this menu you plug in your programmer that button lights up and then you press and then what happens is you download it to something like this so this is what i have uh, on my desk that's called a pick dem uh, demo board and i've got an older version of that and this is the actual programmer itself so all the programmer has to do is take the signal that's come down the usb cable and convert it into what's called icsp which is the programming interface that allows these chips to be programmed um, along a little serial link on there so you can pick up these programmers for you get cheap copies for probably 10 20 dollars you can get the real ones for probably about 40 or 50 dollars depending on where you buy them from and the demo boards vary in price massively you can get basic one for maybe 10 or 20 pounds um 10 or 20 dollars kind of price um right up to several hundred if you were um doing this quite seriously and one of the things that's good about the demo board is rather than you having to wire up all of your breadboard like this and put in poking lights into it and resistors and all the kind of stuff that you you'll need to do eventually well this has it already done for you so it has a row of four leds that you can use and they already have resistors in so you don't need to worry about that three push button switches it's got a temperature sensor on here which i think might be that it's got a little knob that you can turn to do different stuff it's got an lcd display and even a little prototype area where you can add more components if you need to so it's just a very quick and easy way of getting something working but like i say you don't need to have that to begin with as long as you have the ide and you can write your programs and then you can run them in the debugger which i'll probably do quickly now if it works um, and then we'll kind of show you what that looks like so Hopefully that's kind of explained roughly where we're going with this. We've got a microcontroller, which is a single chip computer. In the PIC is a trademark and it's a trademark of microchip. So there are other companies who make microcontrollers. PIC seems to be very popular, very easy to buy. Uh, but there are others from people like Texas Instruments, um, Arduino, Arm, all these other kind of people who produce different designs. So there are other ones around. If you find a different one, that's fine. But my examples are all written in microchip C and microchip assembly. So they're going to be similar but different to other manufacturers ones. So let's just show uh, a real kind of basic example of what this looks like. We'll just close these down. So I've written the same program in two different ways. So you see I've got two projects here. And in the next video I'll talk you through how you create a project and do all those kinds of things. And let's just compare the two. So these two programs do exactly the same thing. And we'll start with this one. This is a program written in the C language. 
C's been around a long time, but it's very popular because it's a very thin layer over the top of machine code, or rather over the top of assembly, which is this. Now that's useful because I get to use nice human readable things. We call them high level programming tools like a while loop or an if statement. If something is true, then do something else. Or all those kind of things that are very nice to use for programmers that kind of make sense. We can use them in C, but using them doesn't add lots of extra memory usage, which it would do if we were using a much higher level language like Python or C Sharp or Java. Then there would be, you know, many, many, many megabytes of extra memory that we would need to run those things. So those very high level languages are not suitable for microcontrollers, but... Um, but C is, so we can kind of use that. Looks fairly neat. It kind of does a few things, which we'll talk about in the next video. But you can see the actual main function doesn't do very much. Sets the port port B to be all outputs. It sets bit to, um, sorry, it clears the output. Um, and then it sets bit two of port B to be an output, which is zero. So if that was one, it would be an input. So we're telling it to be an output. And then we get down here and say, while one, in other words, do this bit in the brackets forever, set output bit two to be a one. So that's going to turn a, a, an LED on, on, a, on our board. That's all it does. Very, very simple. Um, it might look a bit weird. You're thinking, why am I sitting in a loop doing the same thing again and again? Well, I could have put that up here, but then probably need to put some kind of no operation down here so it doesn't look too strange. But um, that kind of works, does the job. There's not very much to it. You can see it's quite simple, hopefully quite easy to understand. Assembly, on the other hand, is a bit lower level. So assembly is much closer to how the device actually works. So effectively here, C is hiding some of the details from me about what these things are actually doing. And I'll give you one example is on a microcontroller, certainly on the low level devices, you can't put a number directly into one of these registers. So port B is a register. I can't put a number directly into a port. I have to put it into something called a working register and then move it from the working register into the file register. In other words, it takes two steps to do it. And we can see an example here. I move the value of zero, um, the X is because it's hexadecimal. We'll talk about that later. But this is the number zero and I'm moving that. L is literal, so that's a literal number that I'm moving into the working register W. And then the second line is move the W register into the file register, which is called Tris B. So that's tri-state. It tells the device whether it's going to be an input or an output. So that takes two lines, and you might think that's silly, but that's just how the device works. But when we look in the C program, you notice there's just one line. So when I compile the C program, the compiler is going to take that one line, which reads and writes really easily, and it's going to have to turn it into two lines that look a bit like this, so it works on the device. So C hides some of those details from us, but probably at some level we are still going to have to understand assembly so that we can do some of the more tricky things. We can mix the two, so I can put assembly inside here if I want. Uh, in the C program, but assembly, as you can see, is a bit harder to read. It's written in a slightly different way, and there are a few kind of funny things that you come across which you won't won't find when you program in C. So we're going to kind of do a bit of stuff in both of them, cover some of the basic concepts, write our first program, uh, and then kind of debug it. So I'm running Project Five at the minute. I'm just going to see if this actually debugs because I haven't tested it yet. What you have to do when you debug it is you have to hit that arrow on the side of the hammer and you turn it to build for debugging. If you don't do that and you try and debug it, it just doesn't work. That's fine. I've got a green green message down here saying it's successful. And then again, next to that arrow, I'm going to launch debugger main project. And then if you notice here, it says user program stopped. Why is it stopped? Because it always stops at the start of the program ready to go. Um, and what I'm going to do to check whether it's working is I'm going to look, uh, not the output, at the I.O. pins and RB2, so that's port 2, um, sorry, port B, output 2, 
I want it to turn on by setting a one. So as you can see at the minute, it says the value is zero, so that's off. And what I can do is I can step over this, hopefully if it works, reset the program, because I want to get my little, um, so what's it doing? Oh, sorry, it's because I didn't put a breakpoint in. So, oh, I don't know what's happened there. It says it's running, but let's try running it again. Right, reset. Hmm. Okay, the debugger's gone a bit funny for some reason. I'll just play it anyway. Oh, oh come on. Play it. And now if I look, hopefully, at the output pins, you'll see the output's turned on. I'm not sure what happened there with the de debugger. It's obviously gone a bit funny. But you can see that the output's turned on, so this program works. Like I say, the debugger's very basic. Um, it's not very easy to use in some ways. But for just basic kind of learning stuff, I can do this without needing to burn a chip and to, you know all of the extra time that it takes to try that out. Although it is nice when you do program a chip and it all kinds of works. That's all really nice as well. Um, so I'm going to stop that. If I go back to project four, um, and I uh, can't remember how I set that to be the default project. Um, but, ooh, so let's just close project five. That'd be the easiest way to do it. Oh, go away. No, not got, don't quite know why I can't close project five. But, ooh, Neat, find, delete. Oh, sorry, it's because I'm in the wrong place. Um, so that's the one that I want to build. So I'm going to set that as the main project so that all these are now going to point to the right place. And let's build this one. Uh, and again, it builds successfully. It's project four, just checking. Uh, and the same kind of thing, if I put a breakpoint in here, and I'm going to start launch the debugger for it. It says user program stopped. So let's just reset it. So you can see here, the cursor stopped at this point in the program. If we go to the IO pins, output two is off. We can see that there. And then what I can do is I can step over these lines. So it's gone, to, it says go to start. So it's gone down here. This is now gonna call the init function. Oh, that's because I stepped over it. So it's already down here. It's already turned the output on and it's sitting down there in the main loop going merrily along. So you can see you can debug assembly and you can debug C. The debug is a little bit clunky sometimes, but um, like I say, it's quite good for simple stuff. Uh, and in the first, uh, sorry, in the next video, uh, we'll look at writing this program and kind of explain some of the features of the microcontroller, some of the reasons for why we write stuff like this, um, and some of the basics just to get you being able to read inputs and set outputs. So hopefully you've enjoyed this video and understand a bit more about microcontrollers, about how we program them. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Any questions, comments or requests, please put them in the comments below.